Thank you for listening to the Conform to Christ podcast, where we seek to engage the mind, affect the heart, and call people to follow Christ. My name is George Mays. Here with me is Jay Jones. Good morning. And it is Text Driven Tuesday. Text Driven. Yep. <clears throat> Monday morning for us. It is a Monday morning. Yeah, we're off to a real exciting start now. Yeah. We don't have any fun and games and shenanigans for people. What are we even doing? Not on our A game. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I guess people will just have to, you know, find their enjoyment just strictly in the word today. Yeah, I'm trying to think of something, uh, anything funny that, that I've seen. Well, I saw something funny, but it's not appropriate for this podcast. <laughs> Chris Rock has finally responded to Will Smith. Oh yeah, I saw he had a he had a stand up special. Yeah, and he torched him. Really? Oh yeah, mm. torched him. Brilliant on the guy's part because now he's just, he's gonna I guess this little comedy thing he's gonna make tons of money off it. Oh yeah. So he held it in. Oh, we yeah. thought we thought he just punked him out. No mm. sir, he was. <laughs> yeah, I don't do stuff like that to a stand up comedian. He, What's wrong with you? He was holding it in till he was going to. Un- he unleashed on it on yeah. him. Yeah, he got his uh, he got his payback. Oh, oh, Will Smith. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he probably wishes he could take that back. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably a lot of things that Will Smith wishes he could take back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would imagine so. Well, shall we jump into this? Shall sure. we jump straight in? Sure. You look like yeah. you're scanning for something. You know, I, you got I, mean, there's you some, I mean, there's some funny stories, but, you know, I told you last week of the uh, the family in rural China that thought they were raising a dog, yeah. and it turned out to be a 250-pound <laughs> bear. <laughs> yeah. True That's story. Funny. True story. Yeah. Yeah. They thought they were raising a Tibetan Mastiff. Yeah. And it was a bear. It was a bear. The uh the woman said that she became increasingly uh what did she say? Alarmed by the uh, the dog's propensity to walk on its <laughs> its two back legs. <laughs> George. <laughs> Why is my dog walking <laughs> walking in here on its two hind legs? <laughs> Why did it take yeah. more than once for her to figure it out? <laughs> I don't know. I was like, <laughs> I mean, I was looking at pictures. I mean, maybe as a puppy, maybe like if you've never seen a dog before. <laughs> but mm-hmm. yeah, um, I mean, I guess these these uh, Tibetan mastiffs can get pretty big, but they're not, big not, and not they're real, ba- not bear big, and they're real hairy. They're you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not, funny. Uh, not it's it was some Ugh. it was some um what's the level above endangered mm, i don't know like they're not endangered protected yet. maybe protected yeah um it was some kind of asiatic bear, brown, that, brown bear. that was um a prote- un, like a and they thought they were raising a protected yeah, species so, yeah, like they thought they were raising the dogs so. <laughs> <clears throat> oh goodness yep. that's funny that's all I got for you, Jay. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I got. That's good enough for me. Good enough. You got my got my laugh in. Okay. I'm ready to go. All right. Yeah. So. All right. Well, um, we're not in Ecclesiastes this morning. Um, yeah. Yeah. So maybe talk. Maybe we could talk a little bit about how we do, like the the preaching schedule here. Yeah. If, if, if I mean, if people have been listening, they know that we go back and forth. We rotate. Uh huh. And so you're in Ecclesiastes. I'm in Hebrews. But maybe maybe kind of the thought process behind the sections because that's what that's that's kind of what people ask me a lot. I don't know if they ask you uh, about that a lot. Like, how do you guys how do you guys divide up your time? Mm-hmm. So maybe we could talk about that a little bit before we yeah. jump into the text. Sure. Yeah, we just uh, we try to divide it up to where it will make like there's a maybe a natural break thought break, mm-hmm. which can be tough. I think both in Hebrews and in Ecclesiastes right now because they kind of just slide into the next thought. Yeah. While keeping elements of the previous thought. Right. So it's difficult to do. My my last break was maybe the easiest in the book because even though the thought is has been introduced, we have chapter eleven coming up, which mm-hmm. which people 
know it as you know this list of of faithful old testament saints so it's, the hall of faith that's yeah, what they so call it right the hall of faith though i did say that to someone that had been raised in church and they had no they never heard it so, yeah they had no it's like the cooperstown so. of the bible yeah so i i um i i don't just rattle that off because apparently not everyone knows that yeah well it's kind of, it's kind of like uh, you know there's you know there's uh, denominations that don't know what the great commission is Really? That's real life? Because it's not in the text. Oh, I see. Right? I mean, it's, okay. it's, in okay. the, it's in the heading like of, of you know, yeah. many Bibles, but, but that's a... That's, the term. That's a, the term is not like the biblical term. Yeah, they know what the Great Commission is. They know is. what it is, but they don't know that label. They don't know by the name. Got it. Like, I yeah. think as Baptists, maybe we've grown accustomed to, to some of these labels, and we just assume that everybody in the Christian world knows what we're talking about, mm-hmm. but... Not everyone knows what we're talking about, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, hall hall of faith. I, I kind of, mm-hmm. I'm a little more reserved with with calling it that than I used to, just because right. I'm assuming that people know what I'm talking about. Maybe they don't. Yeah. Oh yeah. But that was a that was a that was a pretty easy break, just because I knew I'm going to take chapter eleven as a as a chunk. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'll have. I I braked from Ecclesiastes because I have two weeks left mm. that in my preaching coverage, but I have five left in Ecclesiastes, so I can't really do two break and then come back and do three because it messes up kind of a break. There's a clear break here, mm. but then I'd be breaking up. And the reason the I'm five not, if and I the, did it the, the right. reason I'm not just jumping back into Hebrews is because I'm going to be out of town mm-hmm. next Sunday. Yeah, and so we didn't want to mm-hmm. like sometimes just sometimes we'll do four, sometimes five. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you're gonna be out of town, so I got two weeks that are free. <coughs> they're uh, free, free weeks. Mm-hmm. So I had to find like this is the worst part, not knowing what text you're going to preach. Mm-hmm. So I, that's one of the reasons I I like going through books of the Bible because you know where you're gonna preach next. It's where you stopped. Right. So, but that's. So now this week I get to figure out what I'm going to preach again. Mm-hmm. So probably something more more a gospel evangelistic focused. That's the that's the goal the goal and the hope of it. Yeah. So we got two baptism baptism last Sunday this Sunday then one coming up. Yeah. This coming good. Sunday another baptism. So go with a little more um, a text that I can just take by itself. Uh huh. You know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Mm-hmm. So uh so Sunday you did Matthew chapter 20. Yep. Uh and you uh you f- it's the story that's found in verses 20 through 28 but you focused on verse 28. Yep, I did just one verse. Mm-hmm. Uh we're going we had a lot of guests uh yesterday for that came in for the baptism. We've had a lot of new people and as well and I thought you know what I'm just going to try to just give explicit gospel sermon mm-hmm. so there's no question they could ever say we don't know what the gospel is I'm just going to work right through this mm-hmm. um that's that was the goal of that of that sermon of the sermon sunday so a mother's request george that's yeah, the title request. in my bible is uh-huh. the sayers a uh-huh. mother's request yeah. and I was joking with you beforehand that Old James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which mm. their name means sons of thunder. Right. Uh, I guess Is that a t- that's a title that Jesus gave to them, wasn't right. it? Right. Yeah, he did. They're not so thunderous. They got to get their little mommy to come ask a question for them. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it's so funny. Well, uh, it's it's funny seeing the the personalities of the disciples and and people that think that this was just some kind of concoction. You know, from first, you know, yeah. second, second century or whatever. Yeah, they um, made these and stories up, and like they didn't make these disciples look the, great. No, they didn't. Because <laughs> you've got you've got James and John. At one point, they go through Samaria, and the Samaritans don't. They like drive Jesus away, and they're like, "Shall we call fire down from heaven to destroy them? You know, destroy them?" <laughs> And this is, I think that story was right after they couldn't uh, cast out a demon. I think it was mm-hmm. right after the transfiguration where they come down the mountain and, and the disciples can't cast out this demon. And then they're like, shall we call down fire from heaven? Yeah. 
like, who are you kidding? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> who are you guys? That's like that's like going. You couldn't make a layup, and then now you're asking, should I dunk now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah. So they've got a request. Really, it's their request, but you know, I guess they get their mom to do it for them. Mm-hmm. Um. They want to know uh, if they can sit at the right hand, right hand and left hand of Jesus in His kingdom. Mm-hmm. This so the place of prominence, prominence, and the place of prestige. Mm-hmm. And you know from other gospels that this is an issue. Uh, Luke tells us that there's uh, this kind of like competition yeah. uh, dispute arose among them of which one of them was the greatest. Mm. So these are flawed people. Right. It's not hiding in, so now they have, G- they go before Jesus, but their mom goes first, you know, with her sons. She kneels before him very respectfully, mm-hmm. um, and he's like, "What do you want?" She tells him, and Jesus goes through this, saying, "Are you able to drink the cup that I'm drinking?" They said, "Yes, we are able," which is interesting because they do, and he tells them, "You will drink my cup." Like they're going to die as well. They probably don't even have. Any they idea what, what he's talking about. Right. Like, we, can you drink this cup? Yeah. Oh, sure. Like, he's just told them about his death in verses 17 through 19, but yeah. they, they still don't know what he's talking about. So mm-hmm. it's just their their quick response. Yeah. And so then he tells them, it's not for me to decide. It's been decided by my father who's going to sit there. So it's interesting to me. Someone will sit at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus in his kingdom who will it be? Who will it be? I don't know. Well, there's, gonna, at least, there's at least some. In, I mean, some interesting stuff because Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. So, mm-hmm. who's at his left hand? Mm-hmm. Well, I think it just it means like like if a banquet's prepared, uh-huh, you know what I'm right, saying? Like right. you're gonna put yeah. who's closest to me? Yeah, the the main important guys, right? And uh, somebody will sit there. Mm-hmm. But, but who? That's a you know. I would say Paul's probably got to be a, a contender. Yeah, got to be. Yeah, so he suffered quite a bit for the gospel. But there have been people but, through but, history who right. have as well. But that's that's our um, that's maybe our our assumptions, right? Like like you're what you're going to say in the in the sermon is that things are backwards. Right. Things are backwards. So the person that we think is the greatest. The greatest. Is maybe not the greatest. Maybe not, yeah. 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 So he, Jesus, then goes on to, uh, and I'll read the text in a second, but he goes on to to tell them it's not like it is in the Gentile world. In the Gentile world, you know, it's the great people who rule and exercise authority over people. But in his kingdom, it's upside down. Mm -hmm. The servant is the one who's the greatest, not the one that's served. So if you want to be great, you have to become a servant. Then he goes into this, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Amazing verse. Yep. Because it catches in, it's like, what is Jesus, did he ever tell explicitly what his understanding was of what he was about to do or what he was doing? And there are many. This is one explicit one. Mm-hmm. So... You can't buy into this liberal idea that, oh, Jesus just came, he was resisting the world's systems and those in power, and he was on the side of the oppressed, and then they, you know, they got him. Mm. That's what happens when you resist the man. <laughs> yeah. And he got caught up by accident into that whole thing, and uh-huh. he showed us how to suffer, and that his example reveals to us the love of God. Like, no, these verses don't allow that. Right. Um. It's also in Mark's Gospel. You can uh-huh. find it there. It's so. um, I, I've seen uh, I've seen commentators that say that this is at the center of Mark's Gospel, like right. So my like f- as you're reading through it, it's in the center of the book. <laughs> so I, uh, one of my friends, his name is Daniel Brusky, went to seminary with him. He stayed there, got his PhD, became an elder at the church that I was an elder at. Mm. Um, he co-wrote a book and it's about that mm. as the as the interpretive key of all of Mark's gospel. Right. This is what so Mark's So now I'm going to have to buy his book. Okay. All right. It would have been nice to have it yeah. before I preached this. All right. But yeah. <laughs> all right. You want to read this passage for us? 
Okay. You basically already told us everything about it. Yeah, you yeah. Wanna, but they want to hear it. it. They want to hear it themselves. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right, let's look at it. Matthew 20, be, uh, 20, beginning in verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say to these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. All right. Well, you started off your sermon with the uh, the introduction, of the story of Private Ryan. Yeah, old Private Ryan. Um, I haven't seen that movie in a long time. Really? Mm, it's been a long time. It's worth. Uh, it's maybe worth it for you to go back and give mm. it a give it a watch. It's yeah. a great movie. Mm-hmm. I'm, I don't really even understand exactly how he made all that stuff before we had because it came out a long time ago, before there were all of these really? advances. I think I was still in high school. Cinematography yeah, and yeah, mm-hmm. you know all that stuff. I'm trying to pull my notes up here, George. Behind the ball, behind the ball, ball game over here. Let's open that. You forget what you're coming in here to do. Open with. There, there we go. Book mode. So yeah, there we go. There's the there's the old sermon notes. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Private Ryan wanted to uh, use something that would just kind of get people. Locked in, paying attention. Hopefully, it served that purpose. But there's a great scene at the end of that movie where old Private Ryan, old Private Ryan, is standing there over the grave of Captain, uh, what is his name? I can never remember it. The captain who leads the Ranger, the Ranger Squad, on that rescue mission. So Miller is that what you said? Captain Miller, yeah. Right. So Private Ryan's three older brothers all died. It's a true story. I mean, it's an amazing story. Mm-hmm. Old three older brothers died. And the army said, "You know what? That's too much for, for one family to give. So we gotta we gotta rescue the younger brother. They go on this rescue mission. They actually find him, which is crazy. It's like, right. how do you find one per like millions and millions of people over there in that war? Mm-hmm. They find him, yeah. they rescue him, but they all die. And at the end of his life, he's standing there looking at that grave, and he what he's contem- contemplating is the selfless service that they rendered to him and giving their life for his. And if he lived a good enough life." To justify what they did, mm. you can imagine how someone would think that all well, those people died just for you, right. you know, in particular. An amazing story. So we start thinking about that's you can't help but think about selfless service. I can't, anyways. When I think think of that, I think about that uh, Private Ryan. Um, but the goal was that what people would see that when they think hear the word selfless service, they would think about Jesus primarily, who is the greatest. Look, Jesus is the greatest person to ever live, and what's amazing about it is it's not because of anything the world measures greatness by. Right. It's because he's the greatest servant of all time. He's the goat. <clears throat> he's the goat servant, the greatest of all time, undisputed champion of the universe, mm-hmm. servant. You know, I was thinking... Um... I was thinking this. This is what, this is what um, Nietzsche found so absurd about Christianity mm-hmm. was this idea of, of service and laying down your desires for the good of somebody else. Because Nietzsche was all about the the Uberman, the, mm-hmm. the Superman, right? Mm-hmm. And the Superman's the one that throws off all restraints to pursue his own ambitions, his own desires, his own passions. That that for Nietzsche was the ultimate person. Yeah, so and, he's he's operating from the standpoint in there uh after you know where he was after the enlightenment that <clears throat> God's not real. Right. 
And since, well, the famous one is God is dead, mm. who's going to wash the blood off of our hands. He's not saying there was actually a God and we killed him. He's mm. saying there never was, but all of you are still living like there is a God, yeah. and there's not. So he came up with that Uber, the Uber, Uberman uh-huh. or the Superman right. is someone who realizes that and now simply lives as if there wasn't right. ever a God, mm-hmm. creates his own morality, uh, does whatever he wants. So he said the whole world has to be like reimagined. Right. Really, what's amazing is you see Hitler taking that and running with it. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Now, atheists and agnostics don't like to admit that. <clears throat> um, but I, I made the argument, if, if that were true, the greatest man that's ever lived on the face of the planet has to be Genghis Khan. No question. There can't. Who, if there is no God and all there is really is secular materialism, which he would never understood those terms, right? Doesn't know what you're talking about. He just lived it. Then the entire purpose of life is to advance the human race, in particular your own genetics. So, I mean, this is might makes right the will to power, uh, survival of the fittest. Mm-hmm. Genghis Khan is that. Right. Sixteen million men are still related to Genghis Khan today. Mm. That's bonkers. Yeah. <laughs> and that's because he conquered enormous amount of the earth mm. and apparently had a lot of children Yeah, as he went. Mm. That's crazy. Right. He has, so if God's not real, he's got to be the greatest man ever lived. Mm. But I don't think uh, probably atheists and agnostics would want to admit that right? because he was a bad man, Yeah, very bad man. But God is real, and be- and because he is... In God's kingdom, everything's flipped on its head. Jesus is the greatest man that ever lived because he did nothing like Genghis Khan. He is the exact opposite, the servant. He's a servant of all. So his greatness is in his service, and so we're to model that. Mm. We are to be models of, as Christians, those that actually follow Christ, that means we ought to be modeling and cultivating selfless service, which means you got to die to yourself, mm-hmm. which is what Jesus also calls people to repeatedly. It's kind of hard to be selfless when you're the center of everything. <laughs> right. So we're talking about upside-down world, which is really a right-side-up world, mm-hmm. but Jesus has just come to right-side it all. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's what we see, and, and we focus in on on one verse, really, to get it all, and that's verse 28. I mean, it's a simple verse. It's just... Amazing, though, really, what what's said there. I think, anyways. So, yeah. Okay. So we're just going to walk through this verse. Um, your uh, your your big idea was four components of Jesus's selfless service. Mm-hmm. And the point is to uh, see how Jesus lived. What the this is at the heart of his his ministry. This is why he came. To yep. do this, I mean that, that's what he said. This this is why I came to do this. Um, so this is at the heart of of mm-hmm. what he came to do. Yeah, and then based on what he came to do, we're supposed to. He he left us an example that we're supposed to follow. Right. Yeah. Right. And the goal was to have this be so clear and simple that someone who's never been in church would leave and say, "I know who Jesus is and mm-hmm. what he was primarily about and came yeah. here to do." Right. So okay. Yeah. All right, so we got four. We're just going to walk through this this verse, and we'll we'll see these four as we go along. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Well, number one, the first uh, component of Jesus' selfless service is that Jesus. I don't. I'll try to. I'll try to say it exactly as I heard you say it. Jesus, the Son of God, came to humbly serve. Yeah. Yeah. He came. Yep. He served humbly. So this, the idea here, is just found in the first phrase even as the Son of Man came. So we ask the question, what is the Son of Man? And this helps us to get to the humility aspect of it, I think, because the Son of Man is the greatest man. He's a divine figure, divine man. He's a mysterious figure of Daniel 7. Not so mysterious after Jesus comes on the scene, though, because he takes the title for himself. But Daniel chapter 7, we see this vision that this man comes before the Ancient of Days and, and is given a kingdom without end. It covers all people, languages, nations. It covers everything. He's the greatest man ever. Mm -hmm. A kingdom that will never end, an eternal kingdom. So this king reigning over all creation as a divine, this divine man, and Jesus takes the title for himself. Yeah, this is his favorite title. He, uh, he used it, um, 
80 times. Yeah. And he doesn't just mean, well, son of man can just simply mean like a human, a human, but that's not how he uses it. Right. He's, he's using it as a, he's using it as a title. Yeah. And he uses it in such a, um, just kind of casual way that he's assuming that they know what he's talking about. Yes. And, and he's referring back to, to Daniel seven thirteen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, here is the the great man. And what does he do when like when he's here? It's nothing like we would think. Uh, but we should also think about just the humility that's involved, even in his coming. Mm-hmm. That we should we should we should never forget that um, for God to take on human flesh, just to stop and think about it for a little bit. We say it; we're so used to it. God became a man, uh, Emmanuel, God with us, and we just forget about what that would entail. I mean, I I, I talked to uh, I've talked to my one of my neighbors. I lived on Fort Sill was a Muslim, and this was a grotesque thing to him. Mm. Like it it was repulsive to him and offensive. Yeah, to imply that God would become a man, mm. he said God would never do that. That's too condescending. That's beneath him. And he would he would never do it. Right. And I'm like, oh well, I guess you understand the first part of the gospel now. <laughs> that was easy. Can we move to the next part? Yeah. See, so usually people are like, God became a man. Of course. Why wouldn't God become a man to die for my sins? Yeah. You know? So at least he got that part. Um it's really unthinkable, really. Especially when you you're considering like maybe you could Wrap your head around it. Okay, God created an environment, perfect environment, no sin, everything's great. It's amazing. And then God says, you know what? I think I'll take on human flesh and interact with my creation. Okay, that would be still humbling. But this world, this fallen world with all of the sickness and brokenness and evil and sin, mm-hmm. um, God came into this world. And also where we we kind of, we still hold on to the the Greek and Roman um, like demigod oh, idea, yeah. mm-hmm. like uh, Jesus came, but he's he's just um, like you you've said, like he's he's got the human car, mm-hmm. like he, the divine driver <laughs> in it yeah. in the human car. Mm-hmm. So he looks like a man, but you know he's just a thin veil, mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's he's really he's really this demigod right. figure. Um, but that that's not that's not the biblical concept. He uh, Philippians too. He mm-hmm. he was fully God, and though um, though he was in the very form of God, very form. Um, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, something to be held on to. Mm-hmm. So he emptied himself by taking upon himself the the form of a man, mm-hmm. um, with all of its weaknesses. Mm-hmm. Like, what does it mean to empty himself? It doesn't mean that he gave up his divinity. Um, it means that he veiled it in human weaknesses. Mm-hmm. And so the one who never sleeps, now we see him so sleeping. exhausted that he's sleeping in the middle of a storm. Mm-hmm. Right? The one who um the one who uh is self existent and and is uh, does not need anything, um, he now is is hungry. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um that that's so he's taking on the human the human weaknesses, yeah. the limitations of humanity. Yeah, that's right. And that's exactly what it gets at. And so he's exalted to the highest place, given a name that is above every name on and, and heaven and under earth. Every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's exalted because he was brought the lowest. Mm. So he humbled himself more than anyone ever right. and ever will, and therefore, he's exalted to the highest. And we 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 are we are we kind of get stuck on this um, degrees, right? Like God, here's man; he's at the bottom, and it's like steps, and you get up to the top step, and there's God. Mm-hmm. But there's an infinite, there's yeah. an infinite um, space between man and God. Yep. It's it's not like well, there's there's a couple of steps in between us, and he's almost like 
Mm. Uh, he's like an exalted man. Yep. Like the Mormons. Like yeah. he's this exalted man. No, he's he's there's an infinite gap between right. us. And so that's that's what the son did. He he crossed that infinite gap from transcendent to this imminent. Yep. That's right. This imminent person. Uh huh. Right. So yeah, humi- the humility involved uh, in that in the act of, of service that he's willing to to do this uh, makes him the greatest servant ever. Mm. So that's something we need to emulate. If, if if Jesus took on human flesh and humbled himself that great, and that's how Paul uses it in Philippians, mm-hmm. have this right. mind among yourself, which was is yours in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Um, and so he uses that to tell people to serve each other, mm-hmm. to count other people's needs as more important than their own, to right. not look out for their own interests, but the interests of others. And the example is Jesus, who humbled himself. So he came and he served humbly. And that's, that's the goal, is for people to see that. That greatness is not found in exerting oneself, but about in humbling oneself to where you can serve other people. Yeah. Yep, that's number one. Okay. All right, and you know we we have to start with who God is. I mean, that's where we start when we talk about the gospel, mm-hmm. and that's to to um, to consider the the perfections of God, and then we start thinking about the incarnation. Yeah, and when we when we, I mean, we're not going to be able to fully grasp who God is. Mm-hmm. Um, in in all of his infinite perfections, but right. once we once we have you know a biblical understanding of of who God is, then the incarnation becomes all the more yes powerful. That's right. Right. Uh, I mean, Paul says you know the the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, he's the eternal Son of God mm-hmm. in in the heavenlies. Right. Um, though he was rich for your sake, he became poor. So that by his poverty you might become rich, mm-hmm. and that's uh, that's that's good news. Um, so the Son of God, he came to to serve humbly. The second one is that Jesus, the Son of God, served personally. Yeah. So um, the Son of Man came. Right. So it's a point based off of one, one word. word. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, you know, I was just taking inspiration from Lloyd Jones here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you just yeah. can thank he God. Prob- he probably would have preached a whole sermon just on one word. Over the so. word. He came. Yeah. yeah. He came. Yeah. Let's so he, whole he probably would have had four, at, four at least four sermons, <laughs> probably five right. <laughs> on, on verse 28. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The doctor. So I call him the doctor because he's hi- doctor. he's a he's what I would call a hyper observant person. Yes, he would have made a great detective had uh-huh. he not been uh, a preacher. Right. Yeah. He'd be one of those guys. What do they call them? Uh, mentalists. Oh yeah. Where he like takes a look at you and he's like, George, I see that you were at the car wash on Lee earlier this week <laughs> by the th- by the dust that's on your jacket and right. you know. Yeah. That would have been Lloyd Jones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the Son of Man, he came. Um, and, and this is this is important. Um, God did not send um, an emissary. Yeah, right. He, yeah. he didn't send. He didn't just send an angel. Mm-hmm. He didn't. He didn't even send an archangel. Right. Um, he actually came. Yeah, I mean, this again. It's something we just take for granted. Mm-hmm. We're we're desensitized to mm-hmm. the radical nature of what happened. Right. He could have sent Michael, the archangel. He could have just come down to the earth and been like, blew a big trumpet. Mm. Hey, um, God wants to fix all of this, and you can be reconciled to God. Mm-hmm. Or or he even could have had, I mean, he not that it could have, I don't think it could have worked, because there's reasons he needs to be a man so he can atone for our sins, but of all the variety of ways God could have done anything, he was personally involved, right? Like more personally involved in this than anyone else. He's not the deist god that just right. set everything into motion and then he, you know, went on vacation. The the uh, what, what they what the deists call him the watchmaker god. Yeah, like the clockmaker. The clockmaker he winds it up. Yeah, winds it up and and just lets it run. <clears throat> there's no there's there's no interaction between God and and creation. Mm-hmm. Um, even before the even before the incarnation, we see how God is personally involved in the 
the salvation of his people. Mm-hmm. But here we see him actually stepping into time. Actually, John uses the the term tabernacling mm-hmm. amongst us, like Israel in the in the wilderness with God in the tent. Mm-hmm. Now God in the flesh is yeah. tabernacling in the middle of his people, mm-hmm. and that's um, that that that's amazing. Yeah, and it, it demonstrates something. When somebody will become personally involved in your life, it demonstrates that they actually genuinely care. You can say, I love you, or you can say this or that or whatever, but actions demonstrate better. Mm. Love, in a way, is an emotion to a degree, but if separated from action, it's not real. Right. I don't know what you would call it, but not real love. Mm-hmm. And God demonstrates love, and it's John three sixteen. That this is, we've talked about it so many times that this is how God demonstrated His love. Mm-hmm. In this way, God loved mm-hmm. that He sent His His only Son. Um, an incredible sacrifice. On I would say it, what's emphasized here is the love of the Father, but also there's places where Jesus's love is emphasized. But think of the sacrifice in among themselves that is involved here. Right. God gave the, his very best. Mm-hmm. He didn't hold anything back. Right. If there's any question whether God loves you or not, you just look at the cross. And that God gave the very best of what he had. And nothing but that would have accomplished it. Uh, nothing less than Christ even could have accomplished it. Right. And God had every justification he could have. I mean, he didn't need to do this. He could have done nothing, and he would be just still. Right. We could never accuse him of being unjust if he just left us alone to die in our sins. Yeah, but he didn't. He sent the very best. So Jesus came personally, and I, you know, I told this story. I could relate to uh, how the personal service can have an impact on you because when I was deployed, Angie was pregnant with Brooke, and we had been going to a church we had gone to for a while, Stay Springs, right up here. You know, this is a while ago, so I'm sure it's not even the same people there anymore. Yeah. But this was 16 years ago. Um, and we are part of a community group, part of everything. Um, we even signed the floor. We put our names on the floor before they laid the carpet in that new building. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so under that carpet somewhere is Angie in my name. Hmm. Probably a little hard or something, you know. And uh, <laughs> later on in the pregnancy, Angie's pregnancies are usually easy in the beginning, mm-hmm. and then at the end they're 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 pretty tough because she... Yeah. She puts on, I would say, like some women have like normal shaped stomachs when they get pregnant. You know what I'm saying? You've observed it because we have so many births at this church. You got like the normal shaped pregnant stomach, and then you got, is there triplets in there? <laughs> and God saved the best for last, actually. I'm going to let you, <laughs> I'm going to let you just talk. Uh, I'm going to say step out of the room. Hey, you know, it's all good. <laughs> It's all, <laughs> she's not, Angie embraces it, you know, you know, we're at, I don't think. Well, it's those Viking yeah. babies. Well, Evangeline the, was the, was the, the baby. It's the Norse, like, it's those Norse babies. Yeah, I remember, I remember. They come out like frost <laughs> giants. <laughs> uh, for Evangeline did, we, we, the last one we were going there, the doctor did the thing and he was like, oh man, look at that head. <laughs> this is before she ever, you know, and then, and then when she came out, I kid you not, the doctor said a cuss word. <laughs> He said he said a cuss word and he was said something to the effect of like, Good lord, that's a big baby. <laughs> and then but Brooke was the smallest. Okay. But it's still hard on her, you know? Yeah. And uh, the church the church like just forgot about her. Mm. She got to the point where she couldn't really even get out, go anywhere or do anything. And uh man, nobody checked on her, nobody even interacted with her, even call, text, like nothing. Community group, nothing, pastor, nothing. Um but this pastor at First Baptist Church, or First Baptist East, uh, Doug Passmore, he came uh, to the hospital when Angie gave birth, and I thought that was so kind. Yeah, we weren't we weren't part of his congregation. Right. He just knew I was deployed, and she was going to have a baby with no husband hmm. around. And so when we came, Angie started going to church there. When I came back, I. So and that's where I, I ended up becoming a Christian. There, that's yeah. where I was saved. He was preaching from Philippians chapter three. Hmm. So, for the personal service 
has an impact right. beyond what impersonal, you know, whatever's can. Right. I tell you, I had the, uh, my professor, and I'll never forget it ever. It's a great lesson, not just for, I think, for pastors, but for everybody who is a Christian. He said, God didn't send an email, a tweet, or a text message. He sent his son. Mm. And I was like, bam, he, he like hit me in the face with a two by four. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and it's so right. <clears throat> it takes work. It takes time. It's inconvenient to serve someone personally. Mm. But that's how Jesus served us. You know, I, I, I'm sitting over here thinking again about the the Greek gods and how they would take on like human form and and come and interact with people, but it never was to serve. It yeah. always was to do some heinous thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> like punish people or yeah, take may- advantage of them or maybe trick them or whatever. But maybe uh, it's because they're real and they're demons. Maybe, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Um, Just throw that out there. I, I think that we, I think that we, uh, we shouldn't easily dismiss these stories as disconnected from the the true story, right? Like you've you've got these um, the imitations, uh-huh. right? You got imitation incarnations, right? But mm-hmm. here's the real incarnation. Here's mm-hmm. here's the the true Son of God coming in the flesh, not to not to be served, but to serve. Yep. Right. And that's the third and that's point. That's the third point. Yeah. Jesus came and served selflessly. That was like a professional podcast. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Segway. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm sure we'll we'll yeah. screw it up in just a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the third point. Jesus came he, to he served selflessly. Yeah. Yeah. So selfless service. He didn't come to be served. Um you know, it's interesting because people think that humans created this story. And if humans created the story, it'd be nothing like this. It'd be the Greek gods. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's. We don't have to wonder what what the human invention would look like. We've got plenty of evidence mm-hmm. of what the story would look like. It would look like Zeus coming down and sleeping with some guy's wife. Yeah. Right. Uh-huh. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. He didn't. He, you know. He didn't. He never amassed wealth for himself. Mm-hmm. Um, by all, he never. You know. He didn't. I'm sure he had a business so he could take care of his mother. Yeah. But he started his ministry and he didn't even have a place to lay his head. Mm. Like he had to sleep in people's houses. Right. Like wherever God would provide for him through people, um, that's how he ate, that's how he slept. Mm. I mean, this is he literally came acquiring nothing, accumulating nothing for himself at all. Uh, not even trying to make a great reputation for himself. After the um uh, he feeds the thousands <clears throat> They want to make him king by force, and he's got thousands of people, so enough to create an initial uprising, which would have spread like wildfire had he gone along. It would have grown, I'm sure, up into the hundreds of thousands quickly. They they wanted to make him king at one point. Yeah, and he leaves. He leaves them. He does the exact opposite of what we would think a person would do in that scenario. He's like, too many people... This is not the way. I'm out. <laughs> and he goes across the sea to get away from them all, you know? And so they pursue him to the other side. And so, so then he has to hit them with that that hard-to-swallow teaching that disperses the crowd. But he doesn't try to build himself up. Every time he gets a crowd, yeah, he he'll says, say something yeah. so radical, everybody will leave. Mm-hmm. And the disciples are, like, looking at each other like, are we sure we're in this? Or, like, is this for real? You know what I mean? He's like, you guys want to leave too? Is that what you're thinking right now? Yeah. You know, it's uh it's a complete upside down story. It didn't come uh conquering, didn't didn't come to overthrow the government, didn't come as a rich man, a powerful man, influential man, other than his influential, powerful teaching of the of God's word, uh no wealth, no platforming of himself, no making a name for himself. He's always giving glory to the Father. Um and instead of seeking to serve himself, he's just continually serving people in their greatest need. And the aspect of a service, which I think is incredible, we talked about this with our kids this past week, is every part of the world that you see that's broken by the fall after Genesis 3, how the world is just broken and fractured, sickness, disease, natural disasters, hunger, um, oppression, uh, people being cast out of society, abusers in authority, 
Jesus comes addressing all that. Mm. Heals the sick. So everywhere Genesis 3 broke the world, he comes restoring it selflessly. Heals the sick, mends the broken hearts, calms storms, feeds the hungry, touches those that no one will touch, the leper, the cast out, the, those are cast out of society. He, he, he touches them and makes them clean. He heals them. He comforts those who are mourning. Um, his, the, his whole life is just nonstop about other people mm. and not about himself. Um, amazing. He came selflessly, selflessly serving. It's just... Uh, it's it's such a great example to us. We we often forget every element of his life was not about himself. He's either glorifying his father or serving. Well, I don't even put an or. He's glorifying his father by serving other people. Mm. I, uh, I I knew that this was a teaching from the Word of Faith people, and I was trying to find it. Um, I found a, a whole article by Ken Hagen, mm. who was, I think he's, I think he's dead now. I don't know. I don't remember. He, he's in Tulsa mm. at Rama Rama Bible. Um, he's got a whole article on why he does not believe that Jesus was poor. They, wow. He believes that Jesus was, was prosperous. Mm. He believes Jesus was not poor, but was a prosperous man. Wow. Mm. Um, that... Uh, because he has a, he has a seamless... Um, well, yeah, that's one of the that's one of the I mean, it's a long article. I'm, he I'm hasn't not, considered I, somebody might have gifted that to him. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know. Yeah, um, I, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but yeah, I, I knew that that was a word of faith teaching is that Jesus wasn't poor, that he mm-hmm. was prosperous. That's probably the garment. That's probably what he went and took and ran with. Yeah, that he's got. Yeah, anyway, he's got several. Yeah. Well, he is the most prosperous. I mean, he is the king of the universe, after all. all right. But the point is, is he came in his life, he was, he lived as if everyone else were the center of, I have no doubt if you interacted with Jesus, you wouldn't think or have a suspicion, he's actually doing this low-key for himself and using me. <laughs> right. You can get that vibe off of some people. Uh-huh, yeah. You know, you wouldn't do that with Jesus. Well, we're, yeah, I mean, we're, we are so, we're, we're so sinful. Our depravity is so deep that even when we are doing things to serve others, we can be, we can be, um, doing it for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's how deep our, right. our sin is, our self, our selfishness is that we do it so that people will look at us as, look at that person who's, right. you know, so, so generous, mm-hmm. or we do it to, to prop ourselves up, right? Yeah, uh, but not Jesus. Mm-hmm. Not Jesus. He he did it uh, completely selflessly. Yep, yeah. well, that's it. That's the third. All right, and the fourth one is that Jesus served specifically. Yeah, and this maybe is the most important aspect of his service. Um, if you are in great need of something. Right, I think I what did I use the illustration of like a kidney? Like, say you're dying, yeah, yeah, you have kidney disease, you're going to die, mm-hmm. and it's the end. Maybe you got like a week left to live, and uh, you've got a, a relative family member who is a kidney match for you, but they have two healthy kidneys, and um, they show up at your house and they're like, Hey, you got this 80, 80 inch HDR brand new um, Panasonic TV, and I got you a PlayStation 5. Enjoy the last week of your life, buddy. <laughs> I served you. Yeah. I gave you some awesome stuff. Right. Not really what I need. Right. I need your kidney. Mm-hmm. And you're like, nah, can't can't part with it. Yeah. You know, don't know if one of mine will go out or not later. Um, but I did serve you. Mm. Jesus doesn't do that. I mean, he's he's the number one need that man has is that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Um. He came not to be served, but to serve, but give his life as a ransom, a ransom for many. Ransom, there's a twofold, I think, um, there's twofold theology, I guess, behind the word. There's a, there is a wage debt that must be paid. Mm -hmm. So your wage debt is death. The wages of sin is death. Uh, it's a debt you're going to pay. Uh, well, it's, uh, 
It's what you earn for yourself. It's a right. it's a wage going to be paid to you. It's, uh, congratulations. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, we think think of it in covenantal terms. Mm-hmm. That Adam, um, he was the representative for us in the mm-hmm. garden. God gave him a law on the day of you, you know, the day you eat of this, you will surely die. Mm-hmm. And so we're, we all come into the world as, uh, as in Adam and as covenant breakers. And so we experience yeah. the covenant curses. Yeah. De- and, and also on top of being born in Adam's sin, uh, we in sin, as soon as we're able, right. death spread to all men because mm-hmm. all, all sin. Yeah. So, there's never been a person, right, that doesn't die unless God directly intervenes. I mean, right. we got like two yeah. in all of human history that God directly intervened for, but everyone else, we die. Yep. Um, but also, the ransom is a, it's slave language, that you're a slave, and slaves can't free themselves. Mm-hmm. That's like something that some, you can't do it. Right. Someone could buy you free, and then you'd be set free. Yeah. And that's what Jesus says. So he says, anyone who sins is a slave to sin, but if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Mm-hmm. And so this ransom language, it's capturing our greatest need, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, we're alienated from God, we need our sin covered, we need to be forgiven. But beyond that, we also need to be reconciled back to God uh, to attain what was lost by Adam in the fall, and we can't do it for ourselves mm-hmm. because we, if you break any of God's law... Well, you've broken all of God's law. Right. So how can you fix something that is beyond your capacity? Well, you need an external uh, intervention. You need the last Adam, right? You need the last you know, Adam last to come Adam and, to come and be be faithful. Yeah, to come and serve you at your greatest need, mm-hmm. which is to buy you back, um, to die for your sins, to pay the sin debt, um, to rescue you from slavery. And what's ironic about the slavery, if you think about it, it's such a strange thing. If you're a slave to sin, you're both the slave master and you're the enslaved because mm. it's your own sin enslaving you. Right. Someone, it's not some external person or thing. Right. Like, you are your own captive. Yeah, we you, talked about this uh, on as we're going through the doctrines of grace. We talked about total depravity mm-hmm. and that it's not it's not God with his hand on you saying... I know you want to come, but no, you can't come. Yeah, it's we're holding ourselves back. We yep. don't come because we don't want to come. Mm-hmm. And so Jesus comes; he dies for sinners mm. in the place of sinners, and that's our greatest need. Right. Um, it's these are simple lessons that we talk about all the time, but we need to be reminded of, um, and it's a great lesson for us too. Because if, if you have been served by Jesus specifically like this, now what for us? Like, what is the greatest need that any of your friends have? Well, now the greatest need any of your friends have, the way that you need to serve them specifically before any other way is that they need to hear about Jesus. Right. So you have a role to play in this. You know, your your friends, yeah, okay, you, you say your friends, they don't know God. You might could serve them in a whole variety of ways, and they could go, George is a super nice guy. Man, he's just always helping me out. You know what I mean? Like, my car battery died, and... I knew the one person that I could call was George, mm-hmm. and he came right away. That's great, and we should serve that way. But go beyond it. Their greatest need is to hear the gospel, right? And so we should be about that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's it. Simple, simple, easy peasy sermon. It's good to be reminded, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So that's it, George. That's it. Serve humbly, serve personally, serve selflessly. He served specifically. That's it. Very good. There you go. I have no idea what I'm preaching Sunday. You want to plug... uh, You want to plug Life Explored? uh, Yeah, might as well. We're talking about um, the greatest need that people have. Maybe maybe give a little bit more detail for our church people and then maybe people that uh, aren't church members. I'll tell you what I could do. If you talk long enough, I could pull up a video. Sure, yeah. Uh, so we've so I'll, I'll introduce Life Explored. Um, this is going to be a seven-week Sunday night class mm. beginning March 19th at our church, uh, 5.30 on Sunday nights. Um, Life Explored is going to be uh, a class that's designed for people that have maybe some questions about um, life 
and about Christianity and how does Christianity answer these questions? Yeah, the biggest questions. Yeah, in life. biggest questions. Uh, why do bad things happen to good people? Right. Yeah. Why, why is the world the way it is? Like, why do you have this insatiable mm-hmm. desire for more? Like, right. you can't. You're not satisfied. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of our uh, one of our church members, Chris Austin, he's going to be leading the class. It's going to be, uh, like I said, Sunday nights beginning March nineteenth here at the church. It's free. We'll have uh, we'll have some snacks. We'll have child care um, up through what fifth grade. So is that what we said? I believe fifth so. Grade. Yeah. We um, want to we yeah. want to make it easy for people to come. Remove all the you right. Know, I right. can't come because of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. so for and this would be good for new believers also. Mm-hmm. Um, so, if you're a, if you're a, a Christ Fellowship Church member, we uh, we want to encourage you to be um, advertising, sharing this, inviting people, um, thinking of ways in which you will be able yeah. to, to volunteer and, and serve others. And right? you know, uh, one way you could do it is just go through it with your friend. Mm-hmm. Like, say, I mean, it can be an intimidating thing to come to a church right. and say, like, okay, I'm going to come to this class at your church. Just say, yeah, just come with me, and we'll just. You know, we'll spend time together for seven weekends, Sunday evenings, and I'll go through the class with you. Mm-hmm. We'll go through it together. Yeah. So people probably will be more likely to do that mm. if they know you're going through it with them. Yeah. And it's free. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. I've got, I think I've got it. Let's see. Do I have volumes? I do. Little ad. See that? Mm. Ba-bang. <laughs> the best way to. All right. We don't need that. <laughs> I don't need to hear about how to fast. What? Are they? Is YouTube trying to tell me I'm fat? That ain't how you lose weight. Is that trying to tell me I'm fat, George? YouTube, what, do you want, what do you want me to say, Jay? YouTube hit. <laughs> YouTube's been hitting me with a lot of these workout advertisements. Oh uh, yeah? yeah. And I haven't been looking up workout stuff. I don't know what to tell you, man. I think they're looking at my camera and they say that guy's getting fat. <laughs> that's what I think. Yeah. That's not. You know. That's a, how else could it see? I don't know. Here we go. Seven billion of us. All searching for the same thing. It's so hard to find. I've been looking for it all my life. In every place I've lived. Every face I've loved. The one thing, if you lost it, would make you feel like life wasn't worth living. Is that where happiness is? In our relationships? In our money? In the things we own? 
was the best gift God could give you. There you go. Yeah. All right. We can get signed up on Eventbrite. Um, Eventbrite, I think it's called Life Explored at Christ Fellowship Church. Okay. For free. There All you right. go. Yep. Um, but even if they don't sign up, they can show up, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you don't sign up, I mean, we need people to it's, come and uh, watch children. Yep. I'd like to have coffee available every time, maybe a little refreshments. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, get involved. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that uh, that starts March nineteenth at five thirty. Yep. Okay. And it goes seven weeks. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, that's. Uh, you got anything else? No, I do not. Okay. All right. Well, uh, hopefully this has been beneficial, and uh, if it has, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share, and uh, well, tell people. Get the word out. Yeah. <laughs> um, we will be back Friday. Um, I'm guessing we're going to be talking about Irresistible Grace. Irresistible Grace. Okay. All right. Well, until then, we hope you have a good week. God bless. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.